Uh, welcome to the artist talk for Mad Room. Uh, I'm really glad you folks could all join us. Uh, so, just a quick introduction for the artists who will be speaking here today. Uh, we have, of course, Gloria Swan, who is Tangled's Sharon Wolf Artist in Residence, and the artist for this exhibition that you are currently in the presence of. Uh, we have Najla Nubian Love. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Najla um, is a black queer writer, uh, performing arts, and doula arts practitioner. Uh, we have Anique J. Jordan, uh, who is a multidisciplinary artist, award-winning writer, scholar, and social entrepreneur. And we have Charmaine Lurch, who is an arts researcher, interdisciplinary visual artist, and an arts educator. Um, and also we uh, should be joined shortly by Camille Turner, uh, who explores space, home, and belonging in her work. She's a graduate of OCAD and is currently a PhD candidate at York's Faculty of Environmental Studies. And so here's Lori. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm doing something different with the artist talk. Because of the lack of space for people of color, especially women, so when I get a space, I invite the sisters. So what we do, we want to have like just have a little conversation about black women, our world, um, and each one of you guys can talk about your projects. And after that, then we can take questions. And I know you guys have a lot of questions about all of this stuff, and I'm willing to talk to you. But so, um, what I've done, we're going to be uh, like I've got one, a couple of questions, and you guys can have your own questions. My first question would be. Um, How do you market yourself in your work as a black woman artist in an environment that is mostly white male? So I'll start. Um, I think what is most important uh, when I'm marketing my work for me is uh, to be honest in my marketing. So I'm very direct in exactly what I'm presenting. Um, and I try to remember to mention that aspects of my identity. So I am black and I identify as a woman and I come from these different intersections of identity and that is what I'm presenting to you. And that is important. So just naming those things is probably the most important aspect of my marketing. Um, and I think another thing that's important for me is to um, pull with me in my art like different identities as well. So I'll speak about, uh, for example, um, people in my life through characters. So I have like a character in one of my plays that's like my mother-in-law, and she is a um, she lives in the country in Jamaica, way up in the hills. She doesn't really come into town. She doesn't really speak to a lot of people, but she teaches me so much that most people could not and will never access from her, you know? So just talking about that through my art uh, kind of gives life and uh, um, a stage to those identities and stories that people will never have access, but, but are so rich in what they offer to the world, you know? So I pull them into my pieces and give space to that. And Gloria, thank you for creating this space for us to have these conversations. <clears throat> I feel like in the city it's very rare. Um, so for me, the first thing that comes to mind is um, this quote by Sojourner Truth. Um, so Sojourner Truth was a abolitionist um, activist uh, um, who was formerly enslaved. Um, and she started selling some of her artwork as self-portraits of herself. At the bottom of all of her artwork, she wrote, she wrote the phrase, I sell the shadow to support the substance. And it reminds me that what's being sold is an idea of ourselves, but it's not ourselves. We'll forever possess ourselves. And, and that that is a part of our sustenance and part of our survival strategies. 
And so um, I ensure that my work is layered by through having conversations with many, many elders and, and also many people who are younger a lot younger than me to ensure that it's communicated to them. But when it's sold and when it's marketed, I'm maintaining that, that quote, I saw the shadow, not myself, to support the substance. So the question, um, how do I market myself in a white male um, dominated field that I'm in? And I would say unsuccessfully, mm -hmm. first of all. Mm -hmm. And um, I am not, a, I'm not good at marketing. I just, it's not one of the things I do well. Um, so my success, I would say, is slow, sometimes painfully so. And how I have to go about it to have any sort of um, recognition is through encounters. So just human to human, and that is a slow process. And so it it is through my work and by seeing my work, but I really don't get it out enough. I don't show it enough. But when people encounter it, um, they want to talk to me about it, and and that's how it gets transferred. So I would say slowly, unsuccessfully for the most part, but slowly. And that's why we create spaces for us. Too strong for to help. We have to support one another through. So, Oprah's no longer on television, right? So you can't get a car, but you get a ball. So I think, you know, it's a bit of both. There's, you know, 
what whatever the viewer wants to see is is for them to to um, they will understand through their own vision. But I will, there's always that separateness as well. So that's that flux. Um, I love this question. Um, for me, I honestly feel like sometimes I don't put up a um, a, a boundary. And, and then it's so that results in creating, for example, uh, theater work or creating um, performance space photography that is incredibly vulnerable. And after I'm off the stage or after the image is captured, I break down and it's like, whoa, what was that moment? And so, um, and part of that is okay because I still share that work. And part of that also requires that I'm creating work and showing work in spaces particularly that accept that and that can hold that type of energy and spaces that I trust the people who are receiving it can, can, can reflect some of what I'm giving to them back to me. So, um, and I don't necessarily feel like I have to find a boundary for it. I feel like this for me is part of my liberation and, and releasing that is important. Otherwise it gets stuck inside and I don't know how else to speak it. So, um, so yeah. When you're on a project, because most of the work that you do is overt passion, mm -hmm. how do you know when you're not, when you put in too much in, and how do you pull back so so that you don't feel exposed? I feel like when I'm sharing art, a lot of it, I feel really exposed throughout the entire <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think that's what I really like about the art that I'm creating at this point in my life. Um, because I don't have a fear of vulnerability or fears around um, kind of being, giving a lot of myself um, on, uh, on, while I'm performing, right? Because that in itself, for me, the stage or the paper or my sculptures are a safe space for me to explore myself and talk about myself. So um, um, I pour myself into that, like my whole heart, and like that is healing work, and I use my work to, like it's part of my health plan for um, depression, and like it's, it's how I'm able to actually like keep going day to day, and you know, that's something that I've realized through working and being vulnerable becoming afraid and stepping back and then realizing, no, I'm missing out, I have to step more forward. So it's an ongoing process, but ideally, um, vulnerability and, and pushing myself is a part of my process, and it makes me more comfortable with who I am every time. I feel like Oprah right now. <laughs> <laughs> Choose what theme and direction your work will take. Good question. Are you ready? Let's go. Oh, I was gonna like the the thinking phrase. Someone else goes. <laughs> studied under to be young and the be number one principle in her work is focus on almost like a micro specific point it's like your human experience is a human experience therefore someone else will have an entry point whether or not it's about you or about somebody else so focus on what you know best and so I do and so what's happening in my life is what I see in my work and even when I'm responding to something else it's from the perspective of what I'm dealing with so oftentimes my work looks haunting and it looks, <laughs> it looks ghostly and I have ghosts that I have to be dealing with and I like to see them so I can speak to them so um, yeah I mean it comes directly out of me and then and then the second point of entrance is around the community and the issues that are important at the particular time that I'm creating work. Uh, I mentioned that my work is a healing process, so I really, a lot of my work now focuses on things that I'm experiencing or things that 
stop me from, you know, like for example, looking at like violence I've experienced and like how that affects me now, okay? That makes me get up on a stage and like panic. So like now I have to go back and I'm writing a play and it's looking at all the things that brought me to the point that I'm at now. And then as I'm writing, now I have the chance to rewrite what happened. And so every time I perform that, I'm rewriting what happened. And so that's kind of one of the beautiful things about art is that there's the freedom to kind of choose the paths that things go on, um, which also means you can rewrite paths that you've already been on. So I do a lot of that in my art. It's like studying under Debye again, a lot of biomythical for, uh, focus. So it's like using straight out of your life, a lot of things that are like my day to day, um, and then writing what I need for myself to feel resolved, because maybe some of those things are inaccessible, but I can do it in my art and access it. <laughs> so my work comes from my social location as, as a black female artist, and that's where I begin, but I like to shift the gaze off of myself, and so I would say, um, I gather stories through research, and I'm always researching about black subjectivity, and so I'm looking for the, trying to unearth the stories that people might not know and to share them. And so a story like uh, Thornton and Lucy Blackburn, who were black entrepreneurs who lived in my area, traveled up and down um, King Street, lived, had houses in the ward that people don't know about. I'm, I am very excited about unearthing those stories and sharing them. And, you know, our TTC colors come from them. And they helped uh, fugitive um, people who were enslaved. And, and so bringing real stories to life through art and thinking about even how art can move these stories and make a change is, is, um, is what I, how I um, think, about, think about that work. And so I, I, it begins always with me, but from that location, but I move that gaze to, to other stories. Okay, well with me, it's like I pick topics that are taboo, that ordinary people would not approach, like mental health in a black community. Um, and I pick lived experience, experiences, stuff that I already know that I've survived, because I think a lot of stuff that we keep inside there's someone who's going through the same thing who needs to hear that it's okay. It's okay not to be okay. So, I'm a badass. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Did I say ass? Okay. But, um, do you have a career? Sure. Um, <clears throat> a play that I'm currently working on looks at black women and mental health and really in like uh, living with disabilities. Um, and so I'm, I'm writing the play and I'm realizing that I'm, it's a topic that I need to look at right now because I'm at this point in my life where I'm like, okay, I've lived with depression for this amount of years and like, I still feel really awkward to say that to someone. This is like coming on 15 years now. So what do I do? <laughs> like, well, I'm gonna say everything that happens. So, you know, there's points in my play where my character just talks verbatim. I just spoke like, what do I see? What happens when I'm going through like a serious bout of depression? There's these things, because a lot of people don't know. And then in, I'll just put that directly into my play. So it's like, a lot of people now do know, you know? So um, using uh, my art as a platform to just be very descriptive, um, as opposed to just saying, um, and depending where you're at and who you are, that's fine. But for me, I say this is exactly what I'm experiencing. This character is experiencing it as well, right? Or like, um, uh, uh, like experiences going to a lot of doctors and trying to resolve like, what is that like for me? What is that like for me as a black woman? So I, I in detail talk about different doctors, my interactions. This doctor did this. This wasn't, and from an honest perspective, that isn't about attacking anybody, but really about talking about what's really happening, what people are really experiencing. Um, so integrity and honesty are also cores that pull out the story as well. Do you 
Megan, do you have a question or a comment? I mean, I want you to get me like Oprah up in here. <laughs> <laughs> you get a car. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need the mic? Uh, yeah, I'll use the mic. Hello. Um, hi. Um, you spoke, each of you, a lot about uh, kind of where your stories come from, and some of them are personal, and some of them are um, representing your communities, and are timely, and some are a mix of both, or in flux. Um, sorry, I'm out of breath from standing up. <laughs> <laughs> you get a ball. My question is, so which mediums for each of you do you feel um, uh, you like the most that kind of pull out certain, these, these aspects of yourself or your community or you're in flux, and, and how do the artistic mediums uh, relate to that? And, and can you talk a little bit about that? Does that question make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oprah, go ahead. Okay. Um, what's Oprah's best friend's name? stage in front of all of my family. Wow. Yes. That's my very first performance ever in life. Wow. So um, now I went to this audition coming back from a really traumatic year and experience away and um, the, the directors asked everyone why do you want to be a part of it and this was sort of their assessment as to how you, who would get chosen for it and everyone was talking, I went to York University, everyone was talking about the sexual assaults that happened on campus and women fighting back and these, these type of pieces and I was kind of, I had just come back and so I didn't really even know a lot of those stories and for me I was just like I'm just trying to like feel again I'm just trying to figure myself out and take a little bit of my power back and they gave me that role and when I first got the role, I was like, I'm not being the only black woman in this production and playing the role of a woman that is the most sexual role. Mm -hmm. And um, they sat me down, the two directors, and they're like, we chose this role for you because it's the role that commands the most power and you have to rise to that. And they did this exercise when they held me in the, we were in the rehearsal hall and they asked me to walk around the hall and touch everything inside that room. And I did that, lifted up the, the cushions of the couch, like opened the microwave, moved things, and I broke down. And I didn't realize how little power I felt that I didn't even feel like I could explore a room without feeling like, um, without being transformed by it. And that, that first performance, all the different orgasms that I had to do on that <laughs> stage was probably the most healing moment that I had ever had in my life. And it just exploded my, my sense of self in so many ways. And so for me, I, I think I learned the importance and the power that's within performance and within having a body that's physically there that can be touched perhaps or that can be interacted with eyes and, and all these different parts that we can see with each other or experience or with each other in different ways. And so um, I think about performance and I think about um, having another human or being there that, that is there in front of you. And so for me that's the most important medium. <laughs> I use a lot of metal and wire, and I love wire because I'm seduced by wire, um, like a magpie, like a you know a raven. Just it's kind of shiny sometimes, and it um, it has memory. You know, when you bend it, it shapes and forms. But 
the way that I love to use wire is to talk about what's visible and invisible. I work a lot with, um, with scientists talking about the wild things in, um, in Canada specifically, and the way that wire is able to, um, I weave the wire, and the wire is able to capture a certain sense of invisibility and also visibility. You know, when a maze in flight, it's almost invisible. It's when it's stopped that you can kind of see it, but it's always moving. And so too with the, um, with the subject of blackness, how we are made hyper-visible and invisible. And so um, people always, because I paint, I'm a painter and sculptor, and um, they ask me why wire? Well, wire is just my line off the canvas in 3D. And it just continues that story so that we can move around it. And so for me, wire is uh, a fabulous thing. So I'll take all your wires. <laughs> I'm giving a call out now. Any wire you have laying around, any kind, you can pass it my way. I'm a visual artist. I write, but I find just because I'm hyper, I'm like busy, duh. <laughs> um, and I work fast. I use a lot, a lot of acrylic, acrylic paint because it dries quickly. Um, I don't know, I'm just, uh, I like using different things. Like, uh, I'm just getting into film, um, installations. So there is no limit. I don't really have a favorite. I just like different, just trying different things. And photography. So. I feel like different stories come out different ways, and I haven't, and every year it's kind of like, or over a certain amount of time, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that I could make sculptures. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that I could draw. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> as things come up, I'm like, whoa. And then, and then I just kind of give space for stories to tell me how I should put them together and how they should come out. Um, if I had to choose a favorite, um, probably music because uh, I love to sing and it's very comforting and like no matter what situation, like music comes to me. Then I wake up, sometimes I'm going to sleep and my foot is like, Tapping to a beat, and I'm like, you can't sleep and tap to a beat. You know, like, it's, it's something that's like, <laughs> uh, like I want to breathe. Um, so, and, and then just the freedom of music. There's like so many notes, so many ways to put notes together. And you can put one word and use that one word for a whole song. And just the tones can tell a whole story, you know? Like, there's freedom, and, and you can feel music in your body. And silence has so much uh, sound or like tone to it, you know? So definitely um, music would be my favorite. That's that one. This year is just a drop in the bucket. <laughs> uh, there are, like I said, I'm in control of what I put out, and there's a lot more to be put out, but society's not ready, and neither am I, because most of this stuff was not done for the public eye. For me, art is very therapeutic, and I just decided just to throw it out there and see how society, you know, art world would take it. And I'm shocked. I mean, it's, it's really been positive. And I don't know what's coming next. So.
childhood experiences uh, as memories that I've tried to um, deny and explode them and um, really understand them. Um, so I'm interested in, in, in behaviors like licks. I'm not very Caribbean, but I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested in um, the word ugly, the word grotesque, um, the word nasty, um, the edges of those ideas, and, and seeing what comes from it, what can be reclaimed. Um, uh, I, just looking at this idea of anti-oppression, I find I've been doing facilitating workshops on anti-oppression for years now. And I stopped recently because it started to feel like, eh, what am I really doing? Um, sometimes I'm in spaces where I feel like the ways that people address anti-oppression, or address oppression are really oppressive. And so I'm trying to kind of like, just look at that for myself and, and kind of figure out what makes sense. But this is like, I guess can be seen as taboo because when I say that, some people are like, oh, so you wanted to be cool to oppress people? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and then, you know, other people are like, well, what could there be around anti oppression? I'm like, well, I've been in five spaces this week where people use different, like, anti oppression language and that they're also facilitating. And so there's, like, isn't fluidity as well in that kind of stuff? So I'm really just trying to explore it in a way without feeling like, badly about exploring it or feeling um, wrong for like being critical of the way that we um, explore like culture and experiences um, in relation to the way that we interact with each other. Um, because that's hard. I live between here and Jamaica and <laughs> when I'm there it's like I'm hearing things all over the place that are like but I hear some of those things. <laughs> and when I hear them here, it's like a completely different experience than to hear them there because of like sometimes because of safety or sometimes because of uh, mm -hmm. um, like I don't even know how to break down to somebody who's never taken an anti oppression training and never been in like social work, social services, you know, like Western like spaces where we have access to certain things to talk about that, that this is a wrong thing that they're saying. I, I'm not there, and that's just an honest thing. So, exploring that. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask because this is something that I wrestle with in my practice too. How do you negotiate representing blackness in? Um, relationship to whiteness and how do you negotiate being um, positioned as uh, uh, educating uh, others about blackness? Very good question. Um, but you can see from my work, you can, from looking at it, you cannot tell that I'm black or not. And I get a lot of people saying, oh, you're not a black artist. I said, well, I am a black person and I do art. So you can't really label me. Um, I do some of my, my sketches, I do ink sketches, which are African figures, black art. But basically my paintings, is, it doesn't, it's not, it's not female, it's not race. So, I'm good with it. I am audaciously unconcerned about positioning my, um, my work against or with, against or with whiteness. Mm -hmm. I'm just 
concerned about creating work that um, is thoughtful, and I've done serious research, and I'm thinking about the communities that I'm representing and how I'm, how I'm placing it. So I'm not posi positioning it against or for anything. It's just, it just is. Mm -hmm. And I also am conscious of, in my work, it is about black female subjectivity, but at the heart of it is what it means to be human. And so I'm trying to get to talk about our common humanity beyond all of those borders and signs and, and words that we use to describe each other. And so that's <laughs> some some characters uh, in my plays will be identified uh, according to like race or gender or, and sometimes they aren't because depending on what their role is not just as like the person they are but like the weight that their character holds in the story that will determine whether I mention like certain aspects of who they are mm -hmm. um, and that's just because as much as right now a lot of my work is focused on uh, bringing black experience to light, it also means that um, I have to like be very careful about what I label as black experience all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So a character in my mind might be black, but I might not write their description that they're black just because anybody could have that experience. And in the same way that we assume this character is probably white because they're doing this or something or people do that. Like there has to be space, I feel like that that the norm is that you might think this character could be anything. Right? Um, and the second part of the question was um, uh, being thrust into a role as an educator, like educating about black experience, how do you negotiate that? If you come to my plays in hopes of being educated about black experiences, I can't promise <laughs> what you're going to learn. <laughs> but what you're not, you know? Like, it's, again, it's where I'm at everything. My plays, my book, it's where I'm at. You might learn. It's not necessarily going to be like this deep experience that you're going to have, you know, at a children's book. It's like black cats and games that kids like and holding hands and singing and holding my sister's hand and like. But those are a part of people's experiences, you know? Or, you know, if you're able to do those things, those are a part. So, not always concerned with that. Uh, yeah. Um, 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 I, I, I don't know if, um, like, I don't think that I have ever produced work um, with a white gaze as the audience. I think what I often do do though is I produce work where, and, and typically I think of my audience as a young black girl. Um, so I'm thinking about myself as a small child and what would have been important for me. And um, so sometimes I do produce work that um, where there's a uh, direct confrontation that's happening where the characters are looking directly back at the audience. But oftentimes when they're doing so, they're doing so as, um, in a way of offering a black audience almost uh, affirmation or, or a type of or tools or something that is holding you in that space. And um, so that's sort of what's more so important to me than anything. And at, at night, because I use a lot of black bodies in my work, I know that I am seen as, this, as a black artist. And I, um, I'm not torn by that label. I feel as though I am black, I am an artist. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I recognize that there's, um, there are consequences for that where you become tokenized and you become the educator and you become all these different roles that you didn't um, sign up for. But because I recognize that, I choose which ones I will take on and the ones that I will not take on, I, you're, I'm very clear about that. Just, I forgot your second part as an educator because I'm an arts educator and I work in the schools um, from kindergarten to right through to the teachers. And um, 
when, when I'm called to do work, I'm, I'm really conscious of moving the work beyond just a decoration, which black artists often, when we put work up, you know, in a gallery, people are coming, I find that, you know, it, it is an add-on or a decorative thing. And so when I come to the students, I'm really conscious um, of bringing, so if they're teaching about um, pioneers, I try and bring in any other cultures who would be considered early, early peoples in Canada. And so the education comes in a roundabout way where I will add black, early black um, entrepreneurs and, 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 and talk about the First Nations. How are they coming into it? So I try and think of it holistically and try and um, approach education from uh, not just a Western lens. Camille, come on up. Oh, please, please. It's my fault, Michelle. I've got a show at York. Also. So she just thought I was at York. Hi. Um, I was just, you can hear me. 
Um, I had a question about um, about sort of context around your work and sort of as individual artists in any situation, um, there are often going to be other uh, sources contextualizing your work, whether it's being in a disability art gallery, whether it's a curator, whether it's um, you know a certain theater space or company that you're working with. Um, and my question was around um, if you have examples or if you, if you would share uh, a situation where you felt supported by that context in all of your multiple intersecting identities um, and, and uh, yeah, what sort of the, the um, most valuable pieces around that were. Is that clear? I feel like I just... <laughs> mm -hmm. I was just nodding that it was clear. <laughs> 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 uh, I would think about it. Well, I actually just had a show... I know, you're making up for I just had a show in Newfoundland, um, in St. John's, and for me, that was a really... Um, a, re a really seminal moment. So the, it, it explores the, um, Anika's in the show as well, it explores the connections between the Caribbean and Canada. And um, it was such an interesting intersection, you know, because it's, it so speaks to, you know, our identities and our context here in Canada. And just the people that came and, um, I just love that Bushra's mom was the first image that you saw. You know, her, um, her, her. She it was her bridal picture. So she's a new bride. She, this is 50 years ago in Newfoundland when she just came, and just the, this expectation. You know, there was just something so beautiful about about um, this affirmation of this this um, this family, this person. And um, and all of us it really carried us, and you know, from, I think for me that was one of the most affirming shows that I've had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've been studying at the Wata Theater uh, the past couple of years, and um, there's a methodology that we use there, self-actualization methodology. So the principles are self-actualization orality, um, looking at the stories we've been told, what we remember, what stories we tell, rhythm, which is kind of just looking at like how we move through our day to day, how we move through the world, um, political content and context, which looks at power dynamics, uh, where we hold power, where we feel that we don't, uh, the language we use and why we use it and how we use it, uh, urgency, what's urgent to us, what's sacred for us, and what is integ integrity and how we live that. So I feel like working there, I can pinpoint tangible moments in the past couple of years where like, I've seen development and growth in the way that I create and how I create and how I honor myself and my creation. So uh, that would definitely be a, a huge part of that is working with and through the methodology, which I will be doing again this year. There you go. Yeah, same example as Najla's um, studying with Dabi for a um, few years past uh, has really pushed me towards creating that type of work. And um, so I did a show the, at the end of my residency last year or something, I'm not good with the time. Um, and it was my first uh, photo series of me nude um, using, uh, embodying the blue devil. And I was like, oh, should I show this? My mom's like, you're showing that? <laughs> 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 and I was like, yes! <laughs> and so I put that up on the wall, and just the, the love that held it, you know, just really affirmed the direction I was going in and the risks that were worth being taken. So, yeah. So doing work about hypervisibility and invisibility, has been interesting because there are a lot of um, people who've done that similar work. And um, 
to put it in context and in my own words and through my own vision, I had to you know look at many people doing that work and what what um, what I found were these beautiful um, discussions, subject artists who had um, who had their own vision about that, and so it created a context where I you know I had a a rich body of work from spoken word, music, just, and different ages, and, um, you know, people in the room and, and on the panel just speaking about different things that I could identify with and, and draw from. So it gave my work context. Out of that huge body, I had to find my own voice. So I'm actually pulling strings from a lot of people but creating my own own things. So I guess the context comes from, you know, the environment and the research and, and the people close to you in discussions, right? And, and through that, if you're lucky enough, you can maybe raise your own voice in a different way also. Let's <laughs> uh, the question. <laughs> I think being around like young black female artists like this who have done so much compared to what I've done because I took time off to raise a family, there is just inspiring. These are my heroes. And I can take my experience, just listen to their stories. Um, it's just so empowering. I don't know what answer the question, but I just feel so comfortable sitting with you know, and talking to you. I love, I love to talk. And I think for me, art is so therapeutic, so healing. Um, and just listening to all these different stories. And everyone has a story. We're all artists. So I don't even know if I answered your question, but shouldn't get paid the same amount of money that the real, that a trained artist get. So I get it all the time. It's like I didn't go to school to learn how to draw a straight line. This is my this is blood. So if you have a passion for it, you keep doing it. There, there's always doors that are open for you. I would say um, find a community. That, that's gonna really carry you through. Say um, in my life, um, that's what's really me. Just having a community, having a community of people that um, you know are like-minded, or that push you in a different direction, or that excite you, or you know all of those things. Um, I'd say you know what your goals are as an artist. Are your goals to be in a gallery? Are your goals to just produce on a regular basis? and work with a mentor who can support those that goal and that vision that you have for yourself. Uh, stick to it and make up your mind. If you feel like I'm an artist and you're an artist, then you're an artist. <laughs> and you just go from there when you present yourself, when you speak about yourself. This term, emerging artist, is like, I have been emerging for <laughs> I think like a lot of artists, more than you would think, 
and even like big name artists, you know, like if you really like someone's art, just approach them and say like, can I just, would you be up for like coffee or a tea or like a conversation or send them an email, just reach out to who's, whoever's art you're interested in. Give them a ball. <laughs> People are more interested in mentoring and supporting sometimes than I think we think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow, you guys said it all. I can add just one thing to um, be fearless and make a mess. <laughs> Let me check on the time. How much time do we have?
I am in the process of working with some theater companies to invite um, invite an audience of writers, poets, musicians, dancers, actors to give voice back to Sikrax. So she, you will hear about her. Unlike the play, um, you hear about her from the, the characters in the play. She's killed off at the beginning. But so I'm trying to give her a voice so that you will hear what she has to say about herself and about the play. So inviting people to interact with the sculpture emotionally, but also from um, research on the play. I think I'm taking a break up from this. <laughs> uh, what I want to do, I want to take this to a uh, different level. So I created over here, say her name, uh, a list of black women killed by police and black trans women who have been killed, murdered, bodies left. So what I wanted to do, because this here, the branch, because black women have been murdered over 40 years. Uh, so what I wanted to do is like, if you remember uh, Billy Holiday, the uh, strange fruit. So I want to create the tree instead of having bodies, have their names. Hang on. So that's my next project. So. Any more questions? How are we doing, Maestro? We're good, we're good. Any more questions? Okay. My question is, um, if you were given tomorrow like unlimited resource, space, and time to create anything that you wanted, Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> what would you do? Who that? Who that? <laughs> I would do. I would fill up this place of art. With, uh, well, I've got like art, installation, there's a film, like so much. Like, I'm 60 years old, so I have to produce now, just in case. <laughs> so it's like 60. Yeah. Oh my God, what's going on? <laughs> I've always loved art. Even as a child, I did art. But, you know, I get married, I have kids. So now it's like, it's my time. So I would just create, create, create. So. And I would bring in more artists. Because we need, like, space, like, this is like when I get space, I bring in other artists because there's so much we can learn from one another. So I would have like this huge art building, free supplies. Come on in. So, <laughs> awesome. yeah, I think I'd expand the Afrodonic Research Lab. It's it's kind of what I'm working on right now. It's it's this kind of singular sort of focus, but um, I I think I'd really expand that. I'm not sure what that would look like yet, though. But um, there's so much work to be done. The, the Afronauts are um, descendants of the Dogon people who left Earth 10,000 years ago. Um, we, we realize that the Earth is in big trouble, so we've come back home to save the planet. Mm -hmm. And so we go to different places and we do interventions, but you know, there are more of them. I'd first pay off the mortgage on all of my family homes. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I had in this money, right? Um, and then I'd buy a big home, and, <laughs> and it would be a, um, a residency space for black artists. There's a space called Black Space in Jamaica that is just for black artists and write, particularly writers to go to. And I create this space just on the outskirts of Toronto where black artists can go and they just need a break to like breathe <laughs> and exhale and create together. And um, yeah, and I would probably also buy a whole bunch of mannequins and line, <laughs> line um, Young Street with them with like these elaborate costumes and say things. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would um, spend at least a year just going to like different arts festivals and like conferences across the world and take like a whole bag of people with me like you can go you can go you can go Build 
space where our kids can come and like, you know, like different kinds of space where lots of different kinds of people will feel like connected by like body or movement or, you know, like how they move in the world or if it's language, we just have the space like on the go ready to be able to be accessible to everyone. And um, then I would like just perform like mount every play and be like, best play ever over here, guys. <laughs> Free tickets too, so you won't miss it. When I was creating uh, my wild bees for uh, Nuit Blanche, I invited people I met on the street, community, friends, family, and people I bother a lot. And I made the armature and the framework. And I invited people to wrap the bees. And, you know, I, it was free. I was paying them. So I spread food and everything. And they would not stop to eat. They just kept wrapping and wrapping. They're kind of weaving. Almost. And, and they began to talk about the bees. And, own them with, you know, what's my bee doing and all that. And so, and tell them about the bee. So there was a real exchange of knowledge and, and, and um, physical hands-on work. And it was a beautiful moment. I mean, I had to beg them to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and they took the bees with them and kept going. And I always wanted to create that on a bigger scale. So when I'm wrapping Sycorax, you know, I make DNA strands inside the wire sculpture and, 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 and almost skin like with the wire. And it's that weaving that, that I, I want to recreate. So I want to have a, a huge space where I can invite all of you and everyone else that, you know, who would be interested and recreate that moment. It was so beautiful. It was quiet. I kept trying, like I was almost bothering them, trying to talk to them sometimes, <laughs> trying to make them take a break. So I want to recreate that that moment where art and ideas and creativity and community came together, and it was just beautiful. So that's cool. I got a couple people again with questions. I really like the, uh, I love the question you know, if you have to take a look at the group. I want to expand on that even more because I can see you have a lot of love here and all your work. Uh, people are here to see you. So how can we help you? So the answer I'd like is how can we support you? What can we do for you to show our love for you? So I, I like how you said that if you have a wire, I can wire. So <laughs> what else? What else can we do to show our love and support for you? Oh, I see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Because after we leave, you know, we go back and, <laughs> and cry. <laughs> and wonder that question, like, why didn't I ask for help, or how do I go? And, you know, probably I told you I'm the worst one up here to... That's why I gave the mic to you. Maybe silent but deadly, because I just keep going, I never quit, and maybe that's how I survive, but... Um, I don't know, we need a way that more people can hear about our work, so glorious, you know, this kind of venue to speak about it. Most of you might not have known at least half of us here. Um, you know, we don't really get to talk about, like Sycorax, people talk about us, black artists, black artists, but we don't really get to have a voice. So how can maybe in your own way find a way to give us a space to speak, to have a voice, if you know of a, and then you invite us, write our names down, follow us, look us up. Come out to stuff, it's a great way. <laughs> Have a look-see of your own. <laughs> um, yeah, just, I mean, for me, that's the best way to support is just to share what you see. If, if it resonates with you in a way, also like share how it made you feel as well, you know? Like, how did it affect you? Um, and really come out like an experience, just for the experience too, and I feel like that on its own will help me. Yeah. Um, oh, that was like a nice little handful. Oh. <laughs> um, so I have two, two uh, practical suggestions. One is something that was taught by Charmaine and Mosa, who asked the question in the back. 
before, um, and that is to write about the work, write, include the names of Toronto-based artists and the things that you're writing about. Use our work as examples, bring it forward, have people know the names and know that black artists in Toronto are producing work that is important and that is speaking to something. The second thing is even more practical is that there is a little theater school called Wata Theater in the distillery yeah. district and they need money. <laughs> and if you are working and you have extra dollars, you can always donate to Wata, which is a school that not just supports, I mean, naturally and myself, and there's some other artists in the back who are coming up through Wata, but it's supporting our entire city because it's supporting us in many ways. So right now there's a fundraising campaign that's on. Look up Wata Theater and if you can. Go find Com slash save water. Save water. W-A-T-A-H. All right. W-A-T-A-H. <laughs> and tell your families and your family's friends and your co-workers and their friends and their cousins. <laughs> Strangers on the street. I feel like I've gotten to the point where I I need help. Um, and it's mostly organizational help. <laughs> and um, so a while back, I started a, a company called Outer Region. I started it mainly because I, I needed, the, the work wasn't just me. It needed to be a company. It needed to be something beyond me. Um, sustaining a company is not an easy thing. It takes a lot of energy, time, money, all these things. And, um, and yeah, uh, I've been trying to figure out, okay, so how do I, how do I pour something into that? How do I make that alive and, and keep it going? So um, yeah, I'm not quite sure <laughs> what that what that help is that I need, but but um, that kind of organizational help. I mean, like even today, like just not even being here. <laughs> she went to New York University. They're looking for us. But it's my fault. I've got a show there too that should have closed yesterday, but it's still open. Um, to answer your question, what you're doing now, showing up, supporting us, is very important. Uh, we need space. We need our names out there. Mm -hmm. To just go out on the street and say, Gloria's got our show, Tangled. Mm -hmm. um, so that type of support, because we don't have a lot of space uh, or resources support. We need that. And I'm like, what you guys are doing? Thank you. This is, this is, and wine. And wine. And wine. And wine. Oh, wire. Oh, wire. Oh, wire. 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 Yes, uh, uh, to support, like, you know, when there's an art, we don't get into a lot of spaces. So when you're in a space, drop our names. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like first moment. Yes. Take a you know, take a picture. Twitter. What's that other stuff? Social media? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. But anyway, yes, put our names out there. This is a lot of hard work that I give it to you guys. So and thank you for the support. Just keep supporting. And money, no. <laughs> We're going to just break up. You can look at art. You can talk to these lovely ladies if they have other questions. But thank you so much. This is, I'm going to go in the back and cry. I'm so happy. <laughs> thank you all guys for coming. This is really
uh, coming to a tangled event, what we can do to make these events uh, more accessible, better, uh, just any feedback for you. Uh, these paintings are also for sale. To answer the last question, folks. <laughs> um, and so. Yeah, just as another, like, what we can do thing get for us, getting feedback is really important. So if, if this was an event that you were really interested in, you want to see more events like this, just write, yeah. like, fill out in a survey. We have volunteers here who can assist with filling out surveys as well. Um, and it's just a really good way for us to show our funders that these are the kind of events that we need to be doing and, and to represent that. So if, if this was something you want to see more of, then that's what helps us be able to do it. Yeah. Oh, and give Sean a, a big hand. I mean, <laughs>